Hello and welcome to the very first Tim Newton today, a very stripped back sort of program compared to what you may have seen me doing in the past. And uh, I apologize for Cetus Interruptus, uh, the acoustic tiles that are meant to be on the wall. Well, the spray glue didn't arrive, so I haven't been able to put them up. That should arrive today, so this is going to be a bit of a project in motion over the next uh, well days and weeks. But thank you very much for joining us, and uh, I really appreciate the, the fact that you've taken the time to check us out. Now, the format of the program is basically going to be, well, I used to call this what the papers say, but now it's sort of uh, what the internet says. So we'll be meandering through a lot of the different media in Thailand and around the region to see what the main stories are each day. So without any further ado, let's get started with today's Tim Newton Today. Before we get into the first piece of media, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to the channel. That's sort of what you do here on YouTube. I also say that today, uh, I won't be doing this every day, but I'll be doing an editorial today, and that'll be about the fire last Friday and some uh, rather eerie comparisons. But uh, that will be coming up in the latter part of today's program. But uh, to our first lot of media today, the Bangkok Post and the headline, the Bangkok Metropolitan Administration to Levy Land Taxes. Now the background to this story is that we can see on the photo all these patches of blank land around the city. Now these have uh, had a different way of approaching the land tax. What they've said is that if you put plants on there like uh, banana trees, which will sort of grow like weeds here in Thailand, or other sort of agricultural products, wonder if that includes the latest agricultural product. Hmm. But you would be able to uh, be levied at a much lower land tax. But now they're saying, no, no, that's been a bit of a loophole. They're going to actually levy the full amount for that vacant land. So I'm not sure what this is going to cause, either a flurry of new buildings as people try and get rid of their vacant land, or uh, whether they'll tend to not look after those plots of land which recently have at least been cleaned up and planted with some trees, although the reason has not been to grow anything, it's just been to avoid tax. So that's the lead story there in the Bangkok Post to the next story, also in the Bangkok Post and the headline, Patong Tan says Father Taxon wants reconciliation. Patong Tan is Taxon Chinawat's youngest daughter. He was the former Prime Minister of Thailand. And his sister, tax and sister Yingluck Shinawat, was also a former Prime Minister uh, back in 2014 when, of course, they were ousted by the military coup. Now, the sort of general story here is that Patong Tan campaigning up in the northern part of Thailand uh, wants to tell people that her father wants to reconcile with the country. I also note down the bottom there a nice little bit of uh, confluence, the retiree moving to Thailand uh, advertisement and of course Tax and Chinawat being of retiring age and wanting to come back to Thailand and just another aspect of that story where a government spokesperson says that uh, he's accusing the Per Thai party of a hidden agenda to bring Tax and his sister Yingluck back to Thailand if the party takes office well of course that's the general idea the, uh, the former prime ministers would like to return to their home country but there would have to be some sort of official pardon, and that, of course, would have to come from the top. And to the next story, and Thailand hits the accelerator on the extension of the China-Laos Railway. Uh, this is one of those stories that just seems to go on and on. It was probably seven or eight years ago that they were looking at uh, running a high-speed rail, which was going to be backed by China from the border at Laos, and all the way down into Bangkok. Now, the first stretch of that line is meant to be Bangkok to Nakhon Ratchasima, which is about halfway up to the uh, the border there at Laos. Now, this has really been on the go slow, and they've only built some 5% of that railway, but they're looking to accelerate it, according to the transport minister. And there's a lot of advantages of this particular project going ahead. Uh, not the least, I think, is that it could link China, Laos, Thailand, then Malaysia and Singapore. So you could have that, uh, that full experience of, say, going from Beijing down through the Malay Peninsula all the way through Malaysia and to Singapore, the old Orient Express route. And wouldn't that be a great journey? 
And so, yeah, I think they are trying to propel this forward. The opportunity for food exports, I think, is one of the main ones, a much quicker and cheaper way to get food into southern China out of Thailand. Certainly Laos, with their high-speed rail link, has found that it's been a great boon to food exports. So we watch that project with interest. To the next story, and Anaton is launching a bid to become Thailand's next prime minister. And uh, yes, good old Anaton, of course, a favourite of Farang around Thailand, famous for his dirty Farang comments. He's head of the Bum Jai Thai Party, and they already have 50 seats in the lower house of the Thai parliament, and he's commanding some, I think, 61, now that there's been some defections from the Palang Pracharat Party. So Anaton certainly sees himself as the future Prime Minister of Thailand. I love this comment from him. Our party will not create conflict, but will aim at forging unity among the people. Well, dear old Anaton, you have been the most conflicting politician out there. So I'm not really sure exactly what you're saying there. Of course, his big hat to hang on the hat rack is his uh, backing of the decriminalisation of cannabis, which is still a developing story in Thailand. We certainly haven't seen the end of that. The Thai parliament still hasn't debated the new cannabis legislation. So a lot more to be seen on that story. Okay, to our next story on Thai PBS this time, and this is the Mountain Bee Fire. Of course, the fire that was uh, last Friday morning. I'll be doing an editorial very shortly about that. But I just wanted to zoom into this particular photo. If we have a look on the roof here, what is going on? In fact, I think I've got a uh, close-up. Here we go. So these are, are what we would call rubber tyres. Now, it looks to me like... This is not the actual roof, but it's sort of an insulation that they've added to the top of the roof. It's a sort of a product that's got like zinc aluminium lining on one side, and then on the other side, it's got like an insulation, which would, of course, dampen the noise and also uh, prevent a lot of the heat getting into the venue. But uh, you're just looking at that. It looks like they've got the uh, the zinc roof and then over the top they've just laid this uh, this material and held it down with uh, these rubber tires. Now this wouldn't have necessarily added to the fire last uh, last Friday morning, but it's certainly a, a rather interesting way to secure the uh, that material on the roof. And I also notice. Uh, one of the paragraphs in the story saying that the ceiling of the pub was lined with metal sheets and the weight of car tyres might help to reduce the vibration of the metal sheets and the structure of the building when the band was playing. Rather odd sort of way of explaining what that might be on the roof, but I'm sure as the investigation continues, we'll hear more about that, which leads us to today's main editorial, which I recorded yesterday, and of course our commiserations to the family and the friends of the 15 people so far that have perished in this horrible conflagration. Another horrendous night venue fire, at least 15 dead and many others disfigured for life. In this case, it was an all Thai affair and the venue, just another cheaply built cavernous barn with a pretty entrance put on the front with a colorful sign. There are also many of these fire hazards around Thailand and you've probably happily walked into them in the past without even considering that safety inspections may not be as vigorous as where you come from. This time it was the Mountain B venue in Sata Hip, south of Pattaya. 15 people confirmed dead at this stage and up to 38 injured, some seriously burned and still on ventilators. We're yet to hear the results of the full investigation but I can guarantee there will be some familiar excuses we've heard many times before. Blocked exits, non-compliance with the building codes, use of highly flammable materials, and operating outside of required permits. None of that is yet official, but you can bet you'll be hearing those phrases. Of course, a raft of officials have already been transferred out of the region to a desk job at headquarters considered a punishment in Thailand where the umbilical cord is cut between their position and the vast amounts of payola that makes their positions so lucrative. We've also had the new Bangkok governor order a purge of city venues, 
already reporting that 83 could be problematic in regards to clear exits and preparedness. We can only hope this is more than a media stunt and that all 83 will be chased up. Now these venues pop up from time to time. The Mountain Bee apparently was only open for a couple of months in the Satahip district south of Patia. They're cheap to build, they just need a committed social media employee to get them known and the word of mouth does the rest. But these places are death traps, nothing more. And it's not as if there hasn't been plenty of prior, almost identical fatal incidents in the past. How many of them have actually been inspected? How many have the required number of extinguishers or indeed a sprinkler system for such emergencies? Why are emergency exits so often blocked? The worst of these nightclub incidents was probably the Santika Club fire, which happened during New Year celebrations in Ekamai, an upscale part of Bangkok, in the first hour of 2009. A total of 66 people were killed and another 222 injured when fire swept through that venue. Coincidentally, the band playing at the time was Burn, and ironically, the name of the event was Santika's Last Night. The fire broke out at half past midnight and people from 13 countries were amongst the dead and injured. Again, waterproofing, black tar, styrofoam and acoustic foam were all part of the problem, allowing the fire to spread quickly. And, again, a lack of exits was the main problem. In the case of the Sand Ticker Club, there was only one main exit available at the time. Adding to a litany of problems, there was only one fire extinguisher on the premises and it was only licensed as a food vendor, so it was meant to be closed at midnight anyway. Then, almost 10 years to the day, on August the 17th, 2012, a fire at the Tiger Disco in Bangalore Road, Patong. Investigations say the blaze either started from a short circuit or could have been caused by a lightning strike on a transformer. Four people died, all found in the bathrooms at the disco trying to escape the flames, including a French and British tourist and two locals. Eleven others were injured. The fire happened around 4am long after the closing time, but the club's owners say the people were inside just sheltering from the rain. A lack of functioning exits was, again, brought up as a key factor to the safe evacuation of the people inside. No jail time was ever served after several owners were charged following a one-month investigation. To be clear, many of these large bars and venues are basically fancied up, decorated barns or warehouse structures with a bespoke piece of enticing entrance nailed to the front with a tempting neon sign. They're not properly designed buildings and they skirt around the few building codes that do exist. None of these venues, including the Mountain Bar, would have passed any slightly rigorous inspection. Apart from these three incidents, there are plenty of others, luckily far less fatal, but nonetheless just big empty death traps where people are packed in and then operated beyond the allowed operating hours, usually in clear sight of the local police. You can join the dots on that one. Now it's likely the number of dead will keep rising in coming days as some of the worst burned victims succumb to their injuries. Now our hearts certainly go out to the families and friends of the dead and we wish the injured a speedy recovery. But you can't help wondering how many of these poorly built barns are still operating around the country. All just waiting for a small accident to turn into a fatal conflagration where good people die and wealthy owners somehow get away with it all over again. Maybe you need to ask a few questions before you wander in pursuit of a good night into a bar near you. Tim Newton for Tim Newton Today. So we won't be doing editorials every day. Hopefully we'll just be checking out most of the main news stories, a few interesting things, maybe a few funny things. Uh, we didn't really have time today for the regional coverage, but we will try and pick out some of the main regional stories that will be affecting us at some stage in the future. But for me, please subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you around about this time again tomorrow.